Football is the ultimate team game, but that doesn't mean teammates always see eye to eye. Today we are looking at some NFL teammates who absolutely hated each other. Michael Irvin and Everett McIver Being backstabbed by a friend or even a teammate isn't all that uncommon, but rarely has anyone ever been stabbed in the neck. That is, unless you're Everett McIver, standing between Michael Irvin and his haircut. Michael Irvin was no stranger to on-field greatness or off-field craziness, but this moment definitely falls into the latter category. With the hectic schedule that is NFL training camp, most teams have a barbershop at the facility to keep their players fresh. When Michael Irvin walked into the Cowboys' barbershop, he saw big Everett McIver sitting in the chair. We mean like 6 foot 5, 325 pounds big. The Cowboys' fifth year O lineman was getting lined up when Irvin lost his mind. He started screaming seniority over and over again. Irvin, making sure his position was known, expected the younger player to leave the chair so that he could get lined up. Now let's be clear, McIver had been around a while. Like his fellow offensive lineman said next to him, you ain't no rookie, he can't tell you what to do. But that didn't stop Irvin from escalating it into a huge thing that McIver refused to back down from. The two got into an all-out brawl. One thing led to another, and Irvin eventually grabbed a pair of scissors and stabbed McIver in the neck, missing his carotid artery by inches. All all over a haircut. Bill Romanowski and Marcus Williams Bill Romanowski is known, among other things, as a steroid-fueled psychopath and one of the most dirty players in NFL history. While normally he was hated by his opponents, it's only right that he pissed off his fair share of teammates too, namely Marcus Williams. In the middle of the training camp heat, Raiders backup tight end Marcus Williams was tasked with blocking Romanowski. He successfully did so, driving Bill to the sideline, allowing the runner to cut up field. Assuming the worst, which you can always do with Romanowski, he was mad because of how bad he was manhandled. In retaliation, he grabbed William's face mask, violently yanking it until his helmet flew off, then decked him in the face. The punch broke William's eye socket, knocked him unconscious, and broke multiple teeth. Romanowski stood over him as he regained consciousness, shouting, don't ever effin' hold me, before walking off. That punch ended William's career. He was sent to the hospital immediately, and not long after, he sued Romanowski over damages. Terrell Owens and Donovan McNabb Ah, a tale as old as time. A receiver unhappy with his quarterback. What started as a great, productive pairing with Owens and McNabb soured quickly, as the two just never saw eye to eye. They both have totally different stories as to why the beef started as well. Owens felt that McNabb was refusing to throw to him when he was wide open numerous times in a game. Then when he confronted McNabb about it, he told him to shut the F up. McNabb, on the other hand, was annoyed with Owens having to be the central figure of everything. Even with the team's two stars at odds, the Eagles were still Still able to make it to the Super Bowl, where, despite losing, Owens put together an incredible 9-reception, 122-yard performance. When asked about McNabb force-feeding him the ball in the Super Bowl, Owens seemed to be disgusted with the question, saying, if they would have given it to me a few more times, we probably win. That offseason, in an attempt to express why he deserved a bigger contract, Owens stated, I wasn't the one who got tired in the Super Bowl. Another jab at McNabb, who multiple teammates have confirmed was so exhausted he puked in the huddle. The next season, Owens and McNabb continued to perform well on the field, but feuded off it. Owens went on TV and publicly stated that if the Eagles had Brett Favre, they would be better off. This was the last straw for the Eagles, and Owens was traded not long after. This beef still lives on to this day, at least to Terrell Owens, who, after all this time, still said in an interview with Shannon Sharp that he would knock the chunky soup out of McNabb if he got the chance. Steve Smith and Ken Lucas Steve Smith is known for being feisty and competitive. That personality sometimes rubs teammates the wrong way, especially during training camp in the summer heat. Ken Lucas and Steve Smith particularly were teammates for three years. They regularly jawed across the line at each other and got chippy during plays, but it never came to blows on the field, which is what makes this story even crazier. Rather than scrapping after a play, it was at a water break when all hell broke loose. With Lucas and Smith at the bottom of the pile, the entire team soon cast it on the sideline, into the scuffle. At some point in the battle, Smith punched punched Ken Lucas in the eye. It would take everybody, even the head coach, to get the two separated. Lucas was carted to the locker room covering his eye with an ice pack. Both players were sent home for the incident. Lucas reportedly broke his nose, but the issues were settled internally. Geno Smith and I.K. and Impali Now to a beef that had franchise-changing implications. Geno Smith was a starting quarterback of the 2015 New York Jets. I.K. and Impali was a low-round special teams player. Smith agreed to show up to I.K.'s youth football camp in his hometown. I.K. fronted him $1,200 for hotel 
hotel and plane fare. Gino then didn't show up to the camp. The two eventually agreed to just split that cost, meaning Smith needed to pay Ann and Polly $600. However, when August 11th rolled around, Gino still hadn't reimbursed him. So, Ann and Polly pressed him that day at training camp. What are you gonna do if I don't pay you? Were the last words of a man who's about to get his jaw broken. One punch would change both men's lives forever. Gino Smith would be out for six weeks to get his jaw surgically repaired, while I.K. and Impali was immediately cut. He would have never gotten another job in the NFL if it weren't for a petty Rex Ryan trying to get one over on his old team. The moment was a low point for both players and the Jets. Peyton Manning and Mike Vanderjack now we come to one of the most unlikely beefs between a Hall of Fame quarterback and a kicker. Most people don't remember that in 2001, Peyton Manning was still the QB who couldn't win in the playoffs, with an 0-3 record in the postseason. Vanderjack was a great kicker, but regardless, he was the kicker. What he would go on to say was out of pocket for a superstar, let alone a specialist. He went on a random TV show and basically said that Peyton Manning and head coach Tony Dungy weren't the right guys to lead the Colts to a Super Bowl. He said that Dungy was too mild-mannered, he even claimed that the Colts would never get any better. Manning, as good a comeback artist off the field as he is on, said this, Here we are. I'm out at my third Pro Bowl. I'm about to go in and throw a touchdown to Jerry Rice. We're honoring the Hall of Fame, and we're talking about our idiot kicker who got liquored up and ran his mouth. For the rest of his days, Vander Jack would be known as the idiot kicker. It only took one final missed kick in the playoffs the next season, sending the Colts packing, before Vander Jack was no longer worth his big mouth. The Colts let him go that offseason in favor of Adam Vinatieri. Peyton and Indy won the Super Bowl the next year. Doug Baldwin, Golden Tate, and Percy Harvin Percy Harvin was an enigmatic player, but came with a heap of personal and teammate problems in his career, none bigger than in Seattle where he managed to make the entire Seahawks receiving room despise him. His first run-in came at the worst possible time, the week of the Super Bowl. When Golden Tate was asked by reporters at Media Day about Harvin's availability because he had missed the previous game with a concussion, he responded that the Seahawks had made it to the Super Bowl without Harvin and intended to win, with or without Harvin. Percy took offense, leading to a scuffle at the team hotel where Harvin punched Tate in the face, blacking his eye, and then body slammed him into a trash can. That altercation really rubbed Doug Baldwin the wrong way, who was the unquestioned leader of the receiver room, and Harvin never addressed it with Tate or Baldwin. He felt they squashed it going into the next season, but when it was brought up again before a preseason game, Baldwin got heated all over again, and he and Percy had to be separated. Safe to say, Harvin wasn't a good fit at Seattle. They traded him just days later to the Jets. Michael Westbrook and Stephen Davis Now for our next installment of Training Camp Brawls, we bring you to Washington for perhaps the most famous intra-team fight ever. As the story goes, Michael Westbrook, a Washington receiver, told teammates Brian Mitchell, Terry Allen, and Stephen Davis that they were jealous of him for what he had. Well, Davis didn't take too kindly to that, telling Westbrook to shut up and calling him soft. With the helmets and pads off and cameras on, we were primed for an absolute beatdown. Westbrook jumped on top of Davis, wailing on him over and over again. The fight became Westbrook's legacy. He was fined $50,000 and only stuck around for a few more years. Davis would run for 8,000 yards in his 11-season career. Richie Incognito and Jonathan Martin this might be the most hate-filled feud ever, and easily the most messed up. Jonathan Martin was an offensive lineman drafted by the Dolphins in 2012, where league vet Richie Incognito was already entrenched. Now, rookies get hazed in sports all the time, but this situation was just flat-out wrong. Incognito made it his life's purpose to ruin Martin's NFL experience, regularly bullying, harassing, and abusing him. It all came to a head when a group of Dolphins players walked out on Martin at a restaurant, footing him with the bill. It was the last straw for Martin, who left the team for what was first reported as emotional reasons. It rocked the world of sports when all of Incognito's texts were released, including racial, homophobic, and disgusting remarks at Martin. Incognito claimed it was all part of their locker room culture. It was how they bonded. Martin didn't agree with that at all. Martin said he suffered with depression and suicidal thoughts. It didn't help when it came out that the Finns' O-line coach helped aid in the humiliation. Martin never played again, retreating to his family back in California. Incognito would be suspended for a year for his inexplicable actions. Antonio Brown vs. Ben Roethlisberger The most painful breakups come from the closest relationship. Antonio Brown and Big Ben had a connection second to none in the 2010s, with Ben throwing him the ball, AB put together perhaps the greatest four-year receiving stretch ever. But 
all great things must come to an end, and in this case, it was far from a storybook. The first public rift came in 2017, after Roethlisberger missed a wide-open AB which led to Brown yelling and throwing water coolers on the sideline. Big Ben decided, as he became notorious for doing, to air his opinion out on a radio show. He said, it's just unfortunate that it happened, and it's unfortunate that he acted and reacted that way. Brown is causing a distraction that none of us really need. The first at many public jabs the two would take at each other. Later that season, A.B. was at fault for an interception that lost them a game against the Broncos. Big Ben threw him under the bus again, stating that he didn't run his route correctly. Many reports of the two insulting each other in team meetings came out, showing that behind closed doors, their relationship was rocky as well. When a former Steelers PR department employee tweeted essentially that Big Ben made A.B. and that he wouldn't have the same success anywhere else, A.B.'s response shocked Steeler Nation. Trade me, let's find out. That dissension carried over, and in the final week of the 2008 18 season, when A.B. ran the wrong route during a walkthrough practice, Ben screamed for him to be replaced by someone else. A pissed off A.B. chucked a ball at him and walked out of practice. Brown skipped the rest of the week's practices, which the Steelers tried to cover up, saying he had a knee injury. When he showed up for the game on Sunday and was told he couldn't play, he left at halftime. The image of him in a fur coat would be the last time he was ever seen on a Steelers' sideline. He was traded to the Oakland Raiders following the season. A.B. did congratulate Ben on a great career via Instagram following his retirement this past season, so maybe there is hope for their relationship after all.